All right, look at that. We are officially live. We're officially live for the, for not the penultimate, but the ultimate, the final Impex Distillery deep dive uh, episode. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, who's who's been watching since since mid October up until now. Um, you know, watching every week, mo mostly every Wednesday, and then we had a couple Sundays thrown in. And uh, I was just thinking earlier today that this is the final one. I won't have I won't have a, a Wednesday evening to look forward to 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 have a chat with, with people in the industry whom I know and love. I'll have to fill my Wednesdays another way. Anyway, anyway, um, it is the final episode, and we saved. I don't know if we saved the best for last. We saved we saved the whitest for last. We uh, a gentleman by the name of, well, most people know him. His mother knows him uh, by Jason Neil Johnston. His his wife knows him by Jason Neil Johnston Yellen. His kids know him as dad or that guy, that Scottish guy, and and we in the whiskey loving community know him as the whiskey wizard. The White Walker, Whiskey Jesus, some people call him. Whiskey Jesus, I like that one. Uh, but I'll just call him Jason. Hey there. <laughs> oh, man. You're, oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. It's, you know, doing these week after week after week, it's been great seeing you in the comments and egging people on as they're, cracking jokes or saying things and and here you are now live next to me it's that's funny you say that actually yeah, yeah no I, I think that's that's a good point to start on i, I want to say two things before we really uh, kick off here is number one i i've thoroughly enjoyed these i've i've watched every single one um i it promised does. myself i wouldn't look at the comments but then travis makes a good one so did jared card you know we're off to a terrible start um <laughs> You know, watching these, you know, first and foremost, uh, I give kudos to Impex for doing these uh, and putting them together. I think Sam and Chris and the team, uh, really smart idea. And, and as a consumer, as a whiskey geek, I've loved them. I think you've done you've done a tremendous job, Joshua. I, I know how you. No, I, I know how difficult it is for you to interview people without me bailing you out constantly. And. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Uh -huh. And so I thought, no, you know, he's all right. You know, he's he's kind of the George Harrison of the Beatles. You know, you're all right. You're all right by yourself. So excuse me. George Harrison was my favorite Beatle. Thank you very see, much. See, I, I know things. I know things. And then the second uh, point I wanted to make is yes, I have had a ton of fun hanging out in the comments and and being part of the gang over there. It's it's been a good laugh and we've riffed back and forth. But right now, I actually feel like Jeff Bridges in the early scenes of Tron when he's been pulled into the video game. And, and I feel like I'm in the inner workings of the Impex deep dive right now. And it's, it's going to take me a few minutes to get used to this, Joshua. I'm seeing all, right. all, my, all my compadres over in the comments there. And I, I can't type. I can't be with them. I'm with know, you instead. So, thank you. When you said you were like the dude, I thought you were going to say something about someone pissing on your rug or something <laughs> like that. Um, I, I, I mean, even older school than the Big Lebowski. <laughs> uh, I have some, I have some pointed questions I want to ask you, but before I ask these all important questions, mm -hmm. um, you and I, sir, have poured a very special whiskey that we worked on together, but it predates us being in business together. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, people, and, yeah. yeah. Sorry, was there a question there or was it just an observation? <laughs> <laughs> it was an am observation. I meant to riff so, on that or am I meant to be patient? So what did I do here? Let's, let's talk about this with you leading the discussion. <laughs> See, see, this is what I normally do. I bail you out in interviews. I'm happy yeah, to bail you out. Thank you. 
I feel like you're taken off the concluding episode. <laughs> like Jason will just take it from here. So uh, yeah, cheers to Debbie on that one. That's a yeah, that's a great cheers. great board to be starting with. So yeah, for me, I, I got my start with the University of Aberdeen Whiskey Society. Uh, I went along in the name of making a friend uh, with a Finn named Betty P. Reinen. And and I, I you know I was a member of the University of Aberdeen Whiskey Society. I became co-president with Petty of the, the University Whiskey Society. And then when I moved to the US, I really, I missed having that type of access to, you know, just really, really great bottles. When you're on a student budget, you don't tend to have access to the good stuff, even though it was cheap as chips uh, in the mid to late nineties when I was cutting my teeth on it. And so moved over to the US at the end of 2001. It's actually just turned 19 years. It's about 19 years and a week since I moved to the oh, US wow. uh, full time. Time flies. All right. Yeah, you know right? And so and so by the time I got to about 2003, I was I was jonesing a little bit for a society. One of the things you and I always talk about is whiskey's about community. It's about the other people. And one of the difficulties I think we've all experienced in 2020 is that we've lost that community. And so being over in the comments section over there um, really brings a sense of that community. So I started a whiskey society on the Palouse. The, uh, it, it goes by varying names, actually, but Single Malt Whiskey Society of the Palouse, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society of the Palouse, uh, Palouse Whiskey Club, as uh, Uncle Carl yeah. likes to call it. So it goes by different mm -hmm. names. But I started building this tasting group on the Palouse, and, and it was wonderful, right? Absolute great sense of community, managed to you know, bring in some great bottles, share them with people, talk a little bit about Scotland and distilling, um, and even finally got into talking independent bottling with them. But Glen Glasser, when it was taken over by the, the consortium led by Stuart Nickerson, uh, and mm -hmm. clearly Ronnie Rutledge was a vital part of that as well, they started mm -hmm. doing the, the cask program and punters had a chance to purchase an octave and mm -hmm. and you and i were very early doors uh in our friendship but we, we purchased uh, very early doors but we purchased an octave together and we said okay we'll do 40 shares i'll take well really 20 one for me and 19 for my society you took 20 one for you 19 people that you had in, in kind of a soft form society that you had going on mm -hmm. and and then we we sat on it that was it we had we had an yeah. octave of peated new make glen glasser which if memory serves i think we bought for 700 pounds for the octave 600 600, 600. oh no 600. that's right it was 700 for peated Oh yeah, that's right. Six hundred yeah. for unpeated, seven hundred for repeated. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, um, and so, yeah, that, that that's which, what we did. Yeah. Which, by the way, and and we'll get to this a little later on. I liked how you referred to it as punters. Early on, we thought six hundred pounds for an octave was a damn good price, and for <laughs> consumers, that's an okay price. Especially nowadays, it's an okay price. But for industry, holy cow, would that have been a terrible, terrible, terrible price. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, and that's the thing, right? When you're only buying an octave and, and we were told, oh, it, you know, it'll mature faster. You'll get about 60, maybe even 70 bottles out of it. And um, and that just wasn't true. The, the angel share on it, they found, was about 5.5%, 6% .5, uh, annually which was now reducing you know the amount of liquid that would be available at the end of it it did not mature as quickly as anticipated um you know by the time we bottled it as what did we got the number right on that one didn't we that was a seven-year-old by the time we got around to bottling it yes yeah, yeah. and it was and I'll, I'll put the picture up here so people can see it this was one of 46 bottles so we were told you sh you know, there's a chance you'll be getting around 70-ish bottles from this. So oh, the age share was quite high. I tell you, it, it is not a seven-year-old. I remember the typo from the label. 
All right. We did we did not fill this June of 09. We filled this June of 2010. Of 2010. Yep. And it was bottled as a six-year-old and the typo is on the 09. And the reason I know this is because you and I didn't know each other in June of 09. And so we could not have purchased this octave together. So, and, and the thing we keep saying about, and we just celebrated the 10 year anniversary of the conversation where, where you called me on the Thanksgiving to, to talk about going 50-50 on the company. But we keep saying at that Thanksgiving, we'd known each other for six months. And in mm. that time, we bought an octave together. We have been deep in this relationship virtually from day one, Joshua. <laughs> I'd say so. But let me add this. Let me add this. When you and I yeah. bought this octave, we were like a lot of other punters, especially punters stateside, where we bought it and we thought, we'll get it into the country somehow, right? But the buying it is the important thing. The letting it mature is the next important thing. And ultimately, we'll figure out how to get it bottled and into the country. Yeah. And as it turned out, by the time this matured and we bottled it September of 2016, we had a company, right? At that point, we'd been importing with Impex for four years, over four years, probably four and a half years at that yeah. point. And and so, I, you know, I, you and I are, are very fond of, of Impex. And, you know, from way back in that time, Sam really led the charge for us and really fought our corner from the start of the company. And so we were able to go to our people who bought shares and say, <clears throat> we've got this. We've got the bottling hall. We've got the tall clear rounds. We'll get the label made. Impex will get it approved by the TTB. Uh, we'll send it to our printer. We'll get it on the bottles. We'll get it packed. We'll get it shipped. We'll get it into the country. And then we'll get it to your doorsteps. It was yeah. all there. And it was never the intention. Uh, but it, it just, it came to pass. So here it is now in our glass. And this was the the one and only whiskey. Now, granted, it's it's in the single cast nation label, but this was before we even knew we would have a company. This was, <laughs> we would have an independent bottling company. But this was the first whiskey we've ever worked on together first and only whiskey where we that we've worked on together where we didn't know what it would taste like everything we bottle we taste it beforehand right yeah, well, so, you, you could say we, we tasted this before we bottled it we, we pulled it off site uh okay took let, it out me, the hands. let me rephrase i forget that you that that you acknowledge words have meaning and i have to use them all in the proper way that <laughs> Before we made the purchase, yes, we didn't know what it tasted like. We, it's impossible, isn't it? It's impossible to it, taste something exactly. that doesn't exist. But it's the first and only time we've ever laid down money for whiskey without having tasted it before it's gone into bottle. Part of what you're saying isn't true, because we, you keep, you keep, you keep pulling up the nose before the landing. Like uh, if you say sure. we didn't taste right. the new, if you if you say we didn't taste the new make before it went into cask, yeah, I agree with you. But then you, if you say we didn't taste it before it went into the bottle, we did, and we've also we've also. Oh, what I'm saying. You keep saying the word bottle at the end. Sorry, people. This is just how we talk to each other. That's that, terrible. You know, go on in the comments. <laughs> what, what I'm saying, I'll, 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 I won't use the word bottle. This is the first time we decided to lay down money for whiskey we hadn't yet tasted that's also not true we bought aaron Newmake before the glen glassa oh that's that's the first time the first time yeah. the first yeah. time yeah well you could you could argue and graham usher's got the little printable for the bottom of the screen here um that that should be on all my all my introductions and all my business cards. Thank you, Graham. He gets me. He gets me. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, I hate it. I like this. Like and take three. <laughs> oh, that's good too. <laughs> Daddy and Daddy always arguing. <laughs> Can we move on? Can we just move on? Like I just wanted to pour this so we could tell a little bit of origin. But I have a feeling if I let you go on your way, 
this will be the entire hour and a half, and I have to keep I have to keep you on the leash here, Jason. Uh, so let me People, say one more. viewers. Okay. I, I don't know if the viewers understand how difficult it is to keep you on a leash. I'm giving them Jesus a great example. Christmas. So let me let me say one thing. If you say this is the first time that we purchased new make, then yeah, I, I accept that. But this, but we didn't buy it as the company. The first time we did it as the company was with the Aaron. That's those are the only two points I want to make. If you want to move on, I'm happy to move on. You don't get this from Ollie. Do I do. You? Ollie Chilton doesn't talk to I, you like this. No, because Ollie's a lovely guy. So I, <laughs> a question came in. <laughs> a question came in, and uh, and I want to attend to it because a I think it was a it was a good question, and I think it it'll do a good job of telling people a bit more about Jason. And this is from Arnie B. Joshua, could you please ask Jason what his favorite style of whiskey, American, Scotch, Speyside, Lowlands, Islands, Japanese, and why you like it? Hmm. And you're welcome, Arnie. It's, it's a pleasure doing these. So do we yeah, know, do you, do you I know mean, Arnie B? I, I know Cardi B. I don't know Arnie B. I know Bacardi. Mm, Bacardi. Gotcha. Arnie B. Separate family. Um, let me let me say this, Arnie, because that, that's a good question. I'm I'm never going to say American. Never. It's it's not possible. But 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 I, you know, I I just said a, a moment ago about being in the U.S. for for 19 years now. When I first moved oh, to wow. the United States, I did not understand bourbon. And and the only bourbons that I was exposed to were always far too sweet for me. Mm. Um, and, and even sometimes we have like a plasticky quality to them. They always felt artificial to me. And, and I'll grant, I, I probably wasn't tasting particularly good bourbons. Um, I didn't really have anybody around me who was, you know, really taking me under their wing and saying this, this is a good example of, of bourbon. So for me, and, and I've said this for years and years and years, I'm a Scotch guy through and through. And and whenever I pour Isla, it absolutely fills my soul. Now I'm from the southwest of Scotland. I grew up across the Firth of Clyde from the Isle of Arran. Arran as a distillery is very near and dear to me. And I, I love it when we select Arran. I love it when we bottle Arran. I love it when we buy yeah. new make spirit from Aaron as a company. Uh, the first time we ever did that as a company. But... <laughs> we just put to push these glasses up. Good <laughs> Lord. They just but, keep falling off my face. But, but once you then go off the back of Aaron and you go to the, the Mull of Kintyre, the Kintyre Peninsula, and then you go off the back of that and you make your way to Isla, Isla just makes me so incredibly happy. And, and, and hopefully, and of course, this, this is nothing compared to Travis and compared to, to Jared, uh, Jared Card. Mm -hmm. But over, over my left shoulder, and this, this is what Udi was talking about last week. This is my left, but it's going over my right. Um, this, this shelving oh, yeah. Yeah, unit, yeah. right? This shelving unit here. Yes, you guys. You guys can see it easier than me. It, it's that's all Coholman. That's all Coholman, yep. and um, and I've I've got a, a, a bottle of the inaugural Coholman uh, on that shelf. I would exactly Ben gets it. Ben Ben gets it, and um, and and so yeah, I've got the inaugural Coholman over there. I don't have the anticipation. I've, I've had two bottles of anticipation in my in my days, and I've drank both of them. And I just mm -hmm. found out the other week that uh, a very dear friend uh, and I were actually bidding against one another without knowing it uh, in a recent auction for a bottle of anticipation. Um, mm -hmm. I said, did, did, you, did you get it for such and such amount of money? And he said, I, I did. Did you bid me up? And I said, I did. <laughs> Not on purpose, <laughs> I didn't know it was you. Um, but I will tell you this, because Travis William is with us. Travis Williams. Um, there we go. Coholman, two-year-old anticipation. Ah, and I, there you go. I'm going to enjoy that this holiday season. 
once <laughs> see jared card has outed himself i didn't want to out him um but travis i will be enjoying this once vacation begins december 23rd what was the question <laughs> well it, it was it was the question from arnie b uh who who admitted by the way where's my mouse uh that uh, arnie cannot sing so we can all to be fair on me as well to be fair, I'm not sure Cardi B can sing, but that's another story. Um, I'll hear a word against my girl Cardi B. I I don't know her music. No, Arnie was asking what your favorite style of whiskey, and and I think you've answered it. It's 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 Isla whiskey, Isla Scotch. And and let me let me ask you this, because I know it's changed from time to time. Do you have a favorite? Isla distillery or, or just a favorite distillery, you know, globally speaking. Go on. There you go. I have oh. no other shelving unit full of a distillery's product. <laughs> this <laughs> one wins. If you go over this shoulder here and you go to the third shelving unit, there's Lagavulin yeah. and Beaumore. And actually Port Escape yeah. uh, on that shelf. And so all my okay. all my nice. other islas I try to keep in balance mm. uh, with one another. Mm. Kilhoman, I've, I've gone stupid for Kilhoman. But I'll, I'll tell you this, and you know this you better than anybody. When I was cutting my teeth and learning whiskey, Laphroaig was my absolute go-to. And I, I yeah. just loved, yeah. loved, loved Laphroaig. And and I, I still like Laphroaig. I, you know, I, I think I've reached that point where a lot of other people who like Laphroaig have reached which is I really like some of the single casks that I get to experience from them without necessarily liking the distillery lineup as much as I used to. With that said, Laphroaig 10 cask strength will always be on my shelf, always. Actually, I just bought a batch 11 or a batch 12 uh, just in the last month or two. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, the last the last batch I got was maybe batch eight. Um, so listen, yeah. um, I, I want to I want to move on to a question, but two things here. Yeah. I want to share with people what is in our glass because it looks like you just poured what what I poured. I did. I saw the good Aaron Brasher asking that question as well. And let me get that there, and let me share. Oh, jeez, I guess I got a big, I got, I got to bigify that. <laughs> there we go. There we Imperial go. twenty-three year old. So, so let me ask you this, Jason. Yes, sir. Jesus Christ. Ten years ago, when I had asked you, do you want, do you want to get in business with me to start an independent bottling company? Yeah, which I believe the French for that is voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? I think that's the French for that. I think it is. You got really excited when I said that. <laughs> um, kept on saying wee oui, wee. Oui. Um, so, so when I asked you that, as as someone who just like me had not been in the industry before. What did that mean to you? What do you think that meant to be an independent bottler or to start independent bottling? It's, it's a good question because it's a difficult one to answer because we've learned so much in the last 10 years that mm -hmm. looking back, at what I thought the answer to that question was is incredibly embarrassing. Um, <laughs> we, it's, it's interesting because I, I do hear echoes of this right now with, with how many independent bottlers are coming on the scene. Um, I would say from a consumer's perspective, I, I, I think it looks the same now as it did to us 10 years ago, which was you get some money together you reach out mm -hmm. to any contact you have, no matter how slight, and you say, any chance we can buy some casks, and they sell you some casks. Then you start figuring out 
how do I get this to a bottling hall? How do I get this labeled? And then obviously for us, how do we get this into the United States? And in, in anticipation of coming on here tonight, I was trying to think back to how we even had that first conversation with Sam, like how that came about. And I, I feel like it was on your side of things. It was. It, it was because you're thinking, thinking back early on, uh, at that time, Impex was importing Kilhoman and, and Aaron. And you and I were both bloggers, right? And and we and and we would get we would get samples from Impex because we were bloggers. And we met Andy Hogan mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. Impex. Mm -hmm. And we both got on with him quite well. And then when I brought the idea to you, you said, Yep, let's this this is you know, I imagine a lot of people have heard this story, but the answer was yes. And, but how do we do it? Who, what do we do? And you and I agreed, well, first things first, we need to buy whiskey. Okay. We need to buy casks. That's good. And who did we know? Well, this guy, Andy Hogan, we just made friends with, and he was lovely. And uh, he also seemed like a bit of a mover and shaker. And so we said, you know, would, would Aaron be interested in, in selling to us? And bless his heart, he said, he said, without a doubt, uh, we would be more than happy to. And it was that connection that then got us to going back to Impacts and saying, look, Aaron is willing to let us do an, uh, a cask with them. Would you be interested in, in potentially importing this for us? So that was, you know, very early doors, uh, early 2011-ish, somewhere around there. And then again, through Impacts, we, we got our connection to the Wills family. And they sold the the one and only cask uh, to us. <laughs> but okay, so, so right, so so that was us early on thinking, okay, we yeah. can just go to any distillery and see. There you go. There's our kill home in four, yeah. and we can go to a distillery and say, "Will you sell us some whiskey?" But we found out say within the first couple of years that that really isn't the way you do things no it's not right no. Distil yeah. distillery direct relationships are going the way of the dodo um the, the other thing that's going the way of the dodo um is a is a point of difference that you and i were always so pleased with and so proud of was that in scottish independent bottling where you would have yes you would have your brand name but then you would have the distillery name um, and, and we were quite you know, pleased in Scotland to have it that way. In the United States, distillers would distill, casks would be sold, they would disappear. They would then be reborn with their new labels, new stories, new marketing, mm. so on and so forth. And we were always so pleased to be able to say we're an independent author in the Scottish tradition. And now it's really sad to see some of that going away where we're being offered parcels or we're being offered casks, um, but we're not allowed to use the name on it. And that, that, that really disappoints me. And and so, yeah, when you and I were saying, hey, Aaron, you want to do this? Hey, Colholman, you want to do this? Hey, Glenn Murray, you want to do this? Um, it, it's been really, we, we thought we'd get to a point where we'd probably have, you know, 30 or 40 of those relationships uh, in another 10 years. And, and it is interesting going to a distillery and saying, hey, we'd love to buy some of your stuff. And they say, well, we sell to this broker over here and um, go purchase yeah. from this yeah. broker. Uh, yeah. and, and it's kind of like, but couldn't we just purchase from you and not deal with the broker? And yeah, our nice. money is just as good as theirs. Right? Yeah. Right? That's how deals yeah. are. I think Ollie even talked about that. Did he talk about it yeah. on the recording uh, the last time out um, with uh, Smoz? He, Did he talk he, about he that? He may or? have. Um, to be honest, I'm trying to remember in, in what scenario we were getting into that into that yeah. you know partic particular subject. But I think it's a very good point. If you're if you're a distillery that's been working with a broker for the past X number of decades, mm -hmm. 
you know, why would, why would you hurt a re- your relationship, this longstanding relationship, just to get the same amount of money from someone you don't know? Right. And so, so us reaching out to, I think reaching out to Aaron, reaching out to kill home and especially it was early doors for them, right? They were still very much in the brand building and and they are still to this date, but earlier on it was, it was tougher, tougher times. And so they were brand building and, and, and it was likely maybe a, a bit easier to say yes at that time than, than it would be now. Which is um, which is a funny thing to contemplate because in speaking to Anthony, he has no idea why he said yes, <laughs> and, I I and in his words, yeah. regret saying yes. So that's that's always yeah. a good thing to have up our sleeve. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. You um, guys got me so yeah, moment. and that's what he said. Yeah, you you got me in a weak moment. <laughs> so so our understanding of acquiring whiskey shifted. Mm-hmm. Right. It was it was now, OK, we don't reach out to the distilleries and distillery representatives who we had been getting to know over the period of X number of years through the blog. Now we have to discover other people who we've never heard of before to see if we can acquire casks. And we, we were very lucky and that we did have some friends in the industry who were bottlers that also sold some casks. And afforded us, and and to this day, I would our most of our brokers afford us this, afford us the ability to taste the whiskey, taste the casks before bottling. One of the things that scared the living crap out of me, and and I'd love to hear your side of the story. Um, though I know we lived through it together, so I guess it's our viewers that would love to hear this side of the story. Is we went from a place where we thought we could taste everything before we bottle it to, oh, if you want to work with me, you need to buy things sight unseen. And if you want to work with this other guy, not only do you have to buy things sight unseen, but you have to buy X number of really young, crappy grain whiskey yeah. that you'll have nothing to do with just to get those other casks. Yeah, it's definitely a dance. So, what what was? Do you recall what was what that was like when we first discovered that that little wrinkle in in the independent bottling, in the having to do the dance, and having in in yeah, in in having to potentially grapple with what most other smaller independent <laughs> bottlers grapple with. And that's not being able to taste the liquid before before you lay money down. Yeah, we we said we're not going to do that. Like it wasn't a particular. <laughs> I, I don't think we really, you know, had a philosophical meditation over it. I think it was just a case of like, yeah, that, that's not going to work for us. Um, and we're that just scared gonna, me personally. Persevering. Yeah, it 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 made me nervous because. I'm happy putting our own money into something that that we could put our names on, but when we can't know if we could put our names on it, it makes me it made me nervous at the prospect of laying down money yeah. to do that. Well, yeah, and I think rightly so, <laughs> especially at that time. You know, you you and I had a wonderful conversation that that I I don't mind sharing ten years down the line, but you and I had a wonderful conversation way way back as we were just planning all of this and we'd said if we could just get together fifteen thousand dollars one five if we could just get together fifteen thousand dollars that would get us three casks and it would get them bottled and it would get them imported and we could get them out of the door and it's it's just not true it's just not the reality and and 10 years ago it just wasn't the reality and it was just it was interesting watching and i think this happens to a lot of fledgling businesses as they're setting up you start with this being your top number and you're like okay Mm -hmm. if we could make that a reality but then you start taking the steps and that becomes your number and that becomes your number and that becomes your Mm -hmm. number that was a that was a 
tightening of the sphincter moment when that number kept increasing uh, and we weren't really getting any further forward. So, so yeah, so the thought of us then having to lay down additional money to get things that we wouldn't even be recouping our costs on right away and mm. potentially not tasting before it went into the bottle was was a non-starter, a non-starter. And I think we've been very lucky in sticking to our guns and in firmly believing in what we're trying to achieve as a business. Mm. Mm -hmm. We have found partners and, and as we, we call them, and it's, it's on our labels now, collaborators who also believe in what we're trying to achieve. Um, yeah. And so seeing Aaron very early on understand that, Glenn Murray, Cole Holman, um, even Ben Riach that, that uh, Debbie Sanders is, is drinking mm -hmm. tonight. You know, Ben Riach were there from the beginning. Yep. Ali Walker, um, who's now <laughs> an independent bottler. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is, right. is hilarious. Um, you know, people saw that. And then, of course, Scott and Becky uh, Harris at Catalton Creek saw that. Um, our friends at Wild Turkey saw that. Eddie Russell sees that. Mm -hmm. um, Robin Cooper, you know, saw that and, and made the connection with Wild Turkey. Um, mm -hmm. George and, Grant. Uh, yes, George, Grant George Grant. George Grant has seen that. And so, you know, in being a little, as we say in Scotland, being a little bloody minded, right? A, a little mm. airsit. There's a good Scottish word for you. Being a little airsit, right? Where you're stubborn, right? So you, you, you okay. oh, right? Like you Jason, you got to say, being like me. So she says, being like me, and then you move on with the rest of the. First, I was pedantic. Now I'm airset. Like, this is just, this is a good time. <laughs> a good time. Next time I need to feel good about myself, I'll re watch this on YouTube. <laughs> uh, um, we, get, we, we have a few questions coming in before we tend to some of these, because they're, they're kind of apropos to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I just, I want to remind people what we're tasting. Oh, geez, I got a big fight again. Um, so we're tasting the Imperial 23. And part of the reason why I wanted us to be pouring this is very early on, I knew there was, there were, there was a, a handful of distilleries I, I definitely wanted to bottle whiskey from. Springbank, Highland Park, and Imperial. And Imperial just seemed like one of those distilleries we would never have the opportunity to bottle whiskey from because it was shuttered, soon to be demolished. Um, it seemingly signatory had, you know, 95% of all the Imperial stock that was out there. And, uh, and year over year over year, we would ask our brokers, any Imperial, any Imperial, and say, geez, we haven't seen any parcels of Imperial. And here we are about to bottle our fourth Imperial. So, so I'm, pre <laughs> I'm pretty excited uh, about that. Um, the question just, is, will it be our last? <laughs> oh, no, it won't. It better not be. Um, so we had some questions come in. Where is it? Where is I'm it? I'm actually, you're, you're still drinking Imperial. I'm going to pour the next on the list and enjoy this while you are. Okay. All right. Perfect. Uh, and uh, do you want me to just hold, hold it up to the camera? This is in honor of of my dad, uh, Michael Nolan. Uh, there's, we, we, we've had a couple of distilleries that we've bottled in honor of people who are dear to us. And the, the Glenbergie was for Michael Nolan, who whose fetish uh, is that distillery. So, um, and then our very good friend, Moscow Jim, uh, who's a Kregeliki nut, and and we anytime we bottle a Craig Ellicky, that's that's in honor of Moscow Jim. So mm. um, I'm trying to think. It, it just is there a third? I'm I'm a big fan of the rule of threes. Is there is there anyone else we think of in particular when we bottle a distillery? Or are those the two? Oh, I'll I'll, I'll throw you this one, Marshall Neyman. Uh I, I think of Marshall every time we we talk Glen Farkless. That's uh, that's, oh, that's that's funny. I. I I thought Dalmore when we bottled our, our first mm -hmm. and only Dalmore. He's a Dalmore fanatic, and I had him in mind when we when we bottled that. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of Michael Nolan, speaking of your dad, look at that. Says, uh, how, how did we come up with the name of the company? 
So this is both live and recorded. Which version of the story are we telling? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Can we tell the version of the story that doesn't uh, in, involve us having to hire more lawyers? <laughs> so, so let's see if we can tell it like this. So here we go. So, so when you made that call on the Thanksgiving, you were known. I, I, my blog was Good Scotch Drink. You were known as Jewish Single Malt Whiskey Society. Um, mm, rolls off the tongue. Yep. That was you. That was you. And so when we launched, we, we, took, we took that well-known name, right? And we ran with it. And another company who had a name that shared a word in there uh, was very unhappy with, with us running with that. And so very early on, we'd gone to Scotland in the March of 2012. Was it, the, was it the JCC, the Jewish Community Center? No, a different company who had a, who had a similar <laughs> one word. Okay, got it. Continue. <laughs> and so, so we went to Scotland March of 2012. Um, we had a blast. We were selecting casks. We were living the dream. And we came home to a cease and desist from this other company that shares a word with Jewish, I guess they share more than one word to be perfectly honest, but um, they, they, they shared some words with the Jewish Single Malt Whiskey Society. And uh, and so we, we went to the drawing board and we said, okay, what are we gonna call this? And so Jewish Whiskey Company became the parent and then Single Cask Nation. Um, it, 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 twofold on that one, it, it said, what we wanted to do pretty clearly, single casks, nation, speaking to the community that we wanted to build. But as we've said many times over the 10 years, it did not tie us into whiskey. And exactly. I would say as much as yes, we had some legal bills and yes, some of our early funding uh, went to lawyers instead of going to whiskey. And that was a little bit sad and disappointing. That's, that's why you can't just do it with 15,000. <laughs> Because you have to put some to the side for lawyers. Anyway, continue. <laughs> lawyers cost money, who knew? And so, um, and so, yeah, I, I feel like they did us a favor um, that we managed in the very, very beginning to get whiskey mm -hmm. out of the name and single cask nation uh, allowed us to, to explore rum and mezcal and cognac and mm -hmm. armagnac and sherry and uh, other things. So... So yeah, the, the name, you know, it wasn't the name from the very beginning, but I, I feel like we landed in a much better spot because of a little bit of early turmoil. I agree completely. Um, and then kind of in line with, with what we're talking about here with the, with the money, Travis wants to know, were, were we self-funded? Did we have some silent investors or casks to get the ball rolling? Yeah. Yeah, we, we had some silent investors, just just a few and, and not really that much money. I think for, for what we've achieved, um, what we borrowed in the very beginning um, was was really very little. Um, yeah, it was, it was good to have. It, it's been funny, though, because since, you know, paying them back or clearing the books, it's been interesting the number of people who approach us seeing if we're looking for funding. Um, mm. which is, is, is always a wonderful thing to hear. And it's nice to be in a position where we're able to say, not right now, but hold that thought because you never know what the future holds. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> and, and then here we go. This is, uh, and I want to talk about this for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, very yeah. nice comment from Chris Wingate. So yeah. You know, I think I think our first foray outside of whiskey was rum, right? Am I correct in that? It was our Spanish rum, the the eighteen year old. Yeah, for retail, that was in our for first retail release. In our first retail release, and then, and then, it was our our good friend uh, Raj Saberwal, who who is friends with Arik Torin, who owns Fidencio. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Fidencio, it's, it's uh, phenomenal uh, mezcals. If you're into mezcals or curious about where to start, it's uh, you can find worse place to start than uh, than Fidencio mezcals. Well priced and good bottlings. Anyway, and so it was Raj Saverwal who put us in t in contact with our Torin to do our our very first mezcal and. 
I wouldn't say this is necessarily our first cross-pollinating collaboration, but it, it's one that I think of that's been one of the earlier, you know, one of the earlier ones for us where we bottled our, our first wild turkey cask, right? This was a new relationship for us, speaking of distillery direct. Mm-hmm. And and we we had just emptied that bottle, that that cask when when we started connecting with our Toran and and he agreed, hey, you know, I, I'd love to work with you. And we had said, perfect. We just emptied this wild turkey cask. We'll send it down to you and we'll put some of your mezcal in, in, into our cask. And right, and we've done other things like that where we've we've purchased some light whiskey that we then finished in a rye cask. And that rye cask was used for a whiskey jubilee bottling and then was used to mature some beer. And then we put the light whiskey in there, right? And so it's it's just us playing around and having fun. But that was still whiskey, right? Here, this is our first time doing it. And now we we're working with a different spirit. And I remember early on talking with you and you just saying that mezcal, every time you smell it, it smells like hangovers and bad decisions. Those that's that's the best <laughs> quote of me you've ever done. That is perfect. <laughs> that is exactly what I would say. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And you've done a 180 without a doubt. Am I correct? It's one of my favorite Jason Kidd quotes. Uh, Jason Kidd was a, a basketball player who was brought in from the Dallas Mavericks to the Phoenix Suns. And uh, when they brought him to the Phoenix Suns, he said, Jason, we're really going to need your help to turn this franchise around. And Jason Kidd famously said, I am here to turn this franchise 360 degrees. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you talk about my turn on on mezcal it it wasn't just 180 degrees joshua it was 360 degrees <laughs> amazing it was twice as much <laughs> and here we are <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't just 180 we did the full 360 um but let me let me ask you this: yeah. what 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 was your turning point? We ask this all the time in 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 our One Nation Under Whiskey podcast. We say we ask people, "What was your spark in whiskey? What was your yeah. spark in mezcal?" It was, and, and I, I don't want to get too sappy here, but I I believe in you wholeheartedly, and and I've I've believed in you wholeheartedly for ten years. It's why we're in business, and you were a champion of mezcal. And so for me, there had to be something there. There had to be something I was missing. And so every time you and I were together, every time you and I were traveling, every time you and I had an event, if we were in a bar, you would order a mezcal, you'd say, mm. stick your nose in it, stick your nose in that one, stick your nose in that one. And we, we got to a point where I, I stuck my nose in one that was not only vegetal, but it was the skin of a freshly picked jalapeno. And, and it was that level of precision and that, mm. that, that level of, of um, I don't want to say quality, like freshness, right? Mm. That, mm-hmm. that was appealing. That was very, because I, I love jalapenos. I, I love spice. I love heat. Um, yep. But yep. that nice, just perfect type of skin on a jalapeno moment, that was when I said, Ooh, okay, now, now there's, there's something, something there. there. Yeah. And, and actually, and not to, not to go too far away from, from your question, but I, I mentioned earlier about not really being a, a bourbon guy and really taking time to grow into bourbon. And I remember moments and especially, and, and, and you know, I still consider myself early on in my in my bourbon life of being in the, the warehouse with Eddie Russell and getting a bourbon straight from cask that was as complex as any scotch I'd encountered before. And being able to say to Eddie, you know, you know, I'm going to say something, you might find it offensive, you might not, but uh, th- this is as good as scotch. And, and it, it's just those moments when you get to say, the things I've previously believed have 
been incorrect. And I yeah. now yep. get to explore this world from this moment on. And so I was, oh gosh, I, I, I really do. I love Mescal so much, so much. And, you know, I, 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 but I'm also getting into rum as well. You know, I've been getting into rum for a number of years, you know, again, since our Spanish 18 year old. I would say mm. I like Mescal marginally more than I like rum, but they're both now up there. You know, Scotch, Scotch is still ahead of it. Um, but the, the rums and the Mescals are just, so intriguing and so fascinating and and speak so yeah. beautifully to place and to people um just just like for me good scotch speaks to place and people yeah yeah, and history yeah i always i always tell people that bourbon is my seventh favorite drink uh but, but mescal is my, which is my offensive, seventh right which which is not meant to be offensive it's not meant to be and i think bourbon is amazing but it's my seventh favorite. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we had some questions here. I I, I like this question of, of David, especially of David Feldner, because we're talking a bit of history here and brand, company building, brand building, et cetera. And I think this is a fair question. Reading some oh. older reviews of your yeah. offering, there was a third gentleman as part of the company. What happened to him? He's not dead. That that's that's the good he part. He's, 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 he's still alive. He's still kicking. Uh, he's not. Um, yeah, yeah. Sh shortly after uh, Joshua brought uh, Jason into the company, we were working on getting the business up and running. And through Joshua's synagogue, um, there was a, a guy who was very well known within the region, uh, who was into helping startups, uh, who had a level of expertise that was hugely. Uh, hugely valuable and mm -hmm. you know we 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 brought him in and and the goal was never for him to be a lifelong member of the company but there was expertise for us in the early days and so Seth Claskin uh, to give him a name um and so <laughs> Seth, Seth Claskin yeah it's not Voldemort you could use no, his name no. Jason. I know. <laughs> and so yes and so yeah, he, he would he would even come to some early festivals with us. He would do some pouring with us, and we would discuss kind of the the early days of the business. He was responsible for the first five year plan for the business. Mm -hmm. uh, we've now completed our 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 second five year plan, and now all hands are on deck for the third five year plan, which is a five slash ten year plan. Um, but yeah, we we always um, try to honor. Uh, Seth Claskin's role in our history, and and I'm I'm sorry if we haven't successfully pulled that off in the first fifty minutes tonight. But thanks to David Feldner for his question. And uh, and just because I know you like compliments, Jason, uh, we have J David Jennings in the room, which is really wonderful. For those of you that don't know David Jennings, um, there, there's no bigger wild turkey fanatic than him, and he's got. Um, his book, American Spirit, uh, which is a story from, from Rippy to Russell about wild turkey. Um, so, David, lovely having you in here. Uh, we got a question from Vlad VD, Vlad Dupes. Mm -hmm. Question for you both, but separately. You okay. were good friends before going into business. Mm -hmm. Were you ever concerned or even thought about that failure in business may ruin your friendship? Nope. Nope. It, 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 you know, if we're answering it separately, I'm actually going to quote Joshua. Uh, jo Joshua and I um, were nice guys. We're easygoing guys. We're approachable guys. We are also incredibly driven and incredibly focused. And neither one of us ever considered the possibility that this venture would fail. And, and, and you know, that, that, that might be one of my favorite words I, I used in a recent episode of the podcast, that we may have been zhuzhun in that, the mm. version of that word you like using is Pollyanna, right? Uh, mm. we, we may have been, you know, Pollyanna and zhuzhun in that, uh, naive, foolish, right? F famous Socrates quote, right? The wisest man doesn't know what he doesn't know, right? Uh, the wisest mm. man knows what he doesn't know. No, what the fuck what does Socrates what he doesn't know? 
I haven't taught in so long. I really shouldn't fill out the Socrates I've, quotes. On I've five. followed up on Socrates, but Socrates is new to me. Famously featured in Bill and Ted. Yep, famously. Yeah, yep, 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 Socrates. Yep. That's a good movie. Um, and so, yeah, you know, when you're starting a business and you firmly believe you can pull it off, um, I never once had the question. At the same time, for me, it's it's a bit like having a, uh, oh shit! What, what do the celebrities call it? A, a post nup, right? Is, is that my using that hmm. correctly? Yeah. Right. The celebrity. All the celebrities are doing that. Yeah. Right. If, if you go into a marriage thinking, "How do I protect myself when this goes sideways or pear shaped?" You're probably not going to have a particularly good marriage. And if if we come into this saying, "Oh, is this going to be the end of the friendship?" You know, you're probably not going to have a particularly good business. And so we just came in gangbusters. And th there was a moment when I was actually talking to our shipper in 2012 about our, our Aaron, our Colholman, and our Ben Riuk 17. And I'd said to our shipper, I cannot believe how slowly everything is moving. This is absolutely uh, driving me and Joshua to distraction. <laughs> and our shipper uh -huh. said, said to me on the phone, guys, I, I can't believe how much progress you've made and how quickly you've made it. And it was one of those moments where you kind of go, hmm, that's right. interesting because you know the industry, okay. And and we've, we've still never taken our foot off the accelerator. We've had difficult years and the last couple of years have been difficult. You know, hmm. we've probably gone slower than either one of us have wanted to go in the last couple of years. Far um, slower, yeah. Right? Yeah. But we still haven't taken our foot off the accelerator. We still want to be doing more than we're currently doing, releasing more yeah. than we're currently releasing. Uh, yeah, I mean, to, to, to that point, I think, assuming slash hoping the stars align, things that we were hoping to launch in 2019 that then got pushed to 2020, that are now getting pushed out to 2021, I feel as if our foot on the accelerator had us doing this, but we're going to go, we're, you know, we're going to do a bunny hop um, onto the next plateau, hopefully. Um, can't yeah. really talk about stuff right now, but but God, I'm so desperate to. Um, there's some more questions coming in, but I want to pour yeah. our third, well, really our fourth whiskey. Yeah, our fourth. We did, the, we did the Glen Glassa. Yep. We did the Imperial 23-year-old. Yep. And we poured we poured the Imperial because we said, you know what? This is a distillery that shuttered. That's cool to talk about. The yep. Glenbergie, we said, I mean, for us, it, I think your point was really, a, a really true and important one is we bottle whiskey for us and for friends. Like if, if we have a friend that we know is in love with something, God, wouldn't it be nice to have him or her in mind and, and say, look, you were in mind when we did this. So that's why yeah, we well, did that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let me add to that as yeah. well, because, you know, we, we talked earlier about the idea of independent bottling. And we talked about an independent bottler brand up top and then a distillery name under that. But one of the things that we always want to be doing as an independent bottler is introducing people who trust our selections, trust our brand, trust our label, trust our palettes. We want to be introducing them to new distilleries. And, yeah. and when you start an independent bottling company and you, you gave your list earlier, right? You talk about Springbank, you talk about Talisker, you talk about Lafroy, you talk about Ardbeg, um, right? These are distilleries that everybody wants to bottle. You know, if, if, we, if we put a bull more up for sale tomorrow, I would say it'll sell out quickly, but you know, so does our Aaron. We're very lucky in that regard. Uh, we've worked hard to be that lucky, as they say. But a Glenbergi, you know, if, and this is sitting on a retail shelf. You're you're asking you're asking big things of your importer. You're asking big things of your distributors, and you're asking big things of your consumers when you bring in a Glenbergi and you sit it on a shelf. And mm -hmm. you know, it it. It would sadden me if independent bottlers started moving away from those, you know, special little unknown distilleries. Um, yeah. You know, you, you and I released a Glenelgin early in the company, and it sat 
in our warehouse for two years, um, right? And, you know, Glen Elgin, it, there's not a lot of independently bottled Glen Elgin. Uh, there's certainly no OB, there's no official bottling of Glen Elgin. Uh, or at least there wasn't. I, I know that they're starting to, to not change. Not in the states. That. Not yeah. yeah that, there might be one. Right. Maybe one official. Um, well, and, yeah. and so you so you take a you take a chance with uh, with Glen Elgin. Um, Josh and I were just talking the other day. You know, if, if you got access to a thrusk, um, would would you put a thrusk uh, on a retail shelf? Um, right, and yeah, you run into these issues of people can't pronounce it, let alone know whether they like or not. Um, but if we've built the name of single cast nation, and if we've built the nation, then we have to believe that that they will come, they will buy it, right? Mm. Um, you, you ever seen Field of Dreams? I know you're not a sports fan. Have you seen the movie a, Field of Dreams? That movie is for everyone, Jason. That was oh, an excellent movie. Oh, interesting. Okay, there you go. Oh, how lovely. How lovely. Um, Plus, I've always so, wanted to play baseball with my dead dad. That checks out. You know, I, I don't think that's bummed out anybody uh, right now. I, I think I can just walk right through this uh, conversational cul de sac without issue. Um, <clears throat> tears. So, uh, so <laughs> you know that that's that's part of that's part of our remit. You know, yeah. you know, um, uh, but, 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 Mark, what? Just did this with, with, with his new company, uh, Walt Whiskey. Him and Kate, they did a manic more, right? And from that initial lineup, that manic more's my favorite. From that lineup, that manic more's your favorite. Um, I, I think I saw yeah. something from Elijah uh, Allen today. Uh, for regular listeners of the podcast, that is, of course, Elijah Imamamamamamon. Um, right. Um, he he loved the Manic Moor. He thought the Manic Moor was his favorite in the line as well. You you got to take these chances. Um, we, we had one of our uh, was it maybe our second retail release, the Milton Duff. The number of people who reached out and said that Milton Duff is fantastic. I never imagined around, yeah. that I'm a Milton Duff lover. Who knew? That's that's what we're here for. Anybody can sell so, a Freud. Anybody can sell yep. Ardbeg. You know, anybody can sell Highland Park. Can you sell Manic Moore? Can you sell Milton Duff? Can you sell Glenbergie? So let's do something that's really, really, really easy to do. Let's talk about how good a guy Sam Filmus is. So we you came to Sam Filmus, right? We came to Sam Filmus and we said, we're, we're really interested because we launched Single Cast Nation Retail. Uh, we're really interested in giving your distribution company. So as aside from Impex Beverages, which is his import company, who imports Single Cast Nation, whom I also work for, um, he owns a dis distribution company in California called JBS Imports. And so we had said, uh, Sam, we really want to give give you uh, a cask if you're in if you're interested. Uh, you know, we've never done an exclusive cask. He said, well, you know, it's, I, I would be interested. And here's where I got nervous because what we had to offer was, was this, hold on, let me bring up the picture. Yeah. Was a yeah. whiskey from the Tormor distillery, which, you know, again, it's, it's one of these distilleries that, that most people have not heard of. Um, they definitely, doesn't have much of a, you know, a quiet fan base. So there are four guys who call themselves the Tormor Four. They're Tormor fanatics. But for the most part, like Milton Duff, like Glen Berge, like Mac Duff, and, you know, all these distilleries, no one knows them. You know, and it's a very difficult position to be putting your importer and distributor in. But mm -hmm. Sam said, give me a sample. So sent him a sample and he fell in love with it. And he said, I'll, I'll take this. And he sold it out right quickly. So, so we're pouring this, this was our first exclusive that we did. And we're, we're going to be highlighting because we're going to start talking about some, some things for 2020. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to set the stage, the, the tour more 21. You and I have not thrown any notes out here. Do you remember what about the tour more you fell in love with? I do. 
I do. Good. Because one of the things yeah. you and I talk about in our selections is we like to zig when others are zagging. If you know Highland Park, for example, as this nice sherried Orkney, we're going to bring out a bourbon matured Highland Park, you know, where we think the spirit's going to come through more than it does in that sherry. This Tormor, mm -hmm. you know, we've we've had some samples where we've referred to the distillery as Tormordor, right? Because Tormor has such wonderful peppery quality to the yeah. rear palate that mm -hmm. sometimes you're you're under a real attack from it. And this one, while it's got the pepper, it's not overwhelming pepper, but there's a certain floral quality to the mid palate that then just rests. It luxuriates in the pepper mm -hmm. to the back end yep. of the palate. And I, I thought that was yep. just such a remarkable example of the distillery. Yeah, I'll, ne I'll never forget in, in, in tasting this just now, I'm reminded of the note that I was really drawn to. And it was the orange jujubes. So, you know, the jujubes, those tiny little candies, they look like they're about the size of a pencil eraser and they're, they're really hard. And the orange one is, is, it's kind of like a floral orange flavor. And, and that's, it goes from mid palate, that floral component to finishing with that orange spice, that orange spice gumdrop kind of component. And it just, it sang and, you know, you and I, we tasted it. We knew we put it in the bottle. We, we, we knew we were confident in doing it, but, but like you rightly said, who the fuck knows Tormor, <laughs> right? And then we offer it as, as an exclusive. And, and again, Sam, the mensch that he is, he tasted it and he said, no, this is, this is really good. I, I'll, I can and will sell this. And so, so, yeah. uh, so yeah, that's why yeah. I wanted to pour this one. Yeah, and, and actually Travis was asking that question in the comments. More importantly, did you try it before you bought it? And yes, yes, we did. We absolutely did. Um, but, but even then, one of 156 bottles at 49% alcohol, right? You're looking at 21 years of age, and anything can happen to that cask in those 21 years. Um, the, yeah. the, fact it, the fact it dropped to 49 is, is unusual. You wouldn't expect it to be that low after just 21 years. And um, the fact is 150 some bottles, you know, that's, that's that a low number good. for what was it? Well, it was a bourbon barrel. So it's not, it's not maybe ridiculous, maybe sillier for Scotland than it would be for Kentucky, but yeah. 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 How, how fun, like what a lovely thing. And it was the first chance we'd taken, obviously we'd, we'd built the business on a, on a direct to consumer model um, <laughs> where you're buying online, you, you know, no matter where you are in the U S you're getting access to it, more or less anywhere you are in the U S you're getting access to it. Then we launched retail. And so now you're relying on your distributors and whichever state is either you're either in or you're near to. And then we took a, a single cast nation selection and said, okay, now this is just California. And, and anytime you try something new, there's always that concern about, well, what will the nation response be to this? I know. <laughs> and that made us nervous. I remember that. Right. Um, and then the nation, the nation gets it. The, the nation understands <laughs> what's good business. And, and I don't think they're looking for us to sacrifice good business in the name of making sure they gain access, e even to the point where we've got nation members helping other nation members get their hands on bottles, whether it be, you know, most of the time it's retail actually. Um, mm -hmm. but, 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 but what a wonderful thing to see. And, and, and again, community, you know, we talk about whiskey community, what a wonderful community yeah. to, to foster uh, and be a part of really remarkable. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm glad people were cool with that. That, that was okay. And, and so I'm going to say this, right. As we, as we, mm -hmm. as we transition here, right. Ben Holman gave us a hard time in the comments, said these two always hinting about the future. And so we're actually going to put some leaves on that branch with the next whiskey. Perfect. And let me, uh, let me, I've got a smallify. Pro level, Joshua, picture, pro level. And then, and then bigify this one. I still have Tormor in my glass, so let's let's finish the Tormor. Me too, but I'm uh, also cognizant of time. We're good. We're good. 
All you have to do, Jason, is stop talking so goddamn much. It's very simple. So, so Frederick it's not, it's Keeter not actually, under whiskey around here. So Frederick Keeter, uh, who I'm seeing for the first time, there's this picture. I, I'm not sure mm. if I actually saw his his picture. There he is, handsome gentleman. Uh, based on your comments regarding direct access to UK distilleries, are you planning on bottling some smaller regional US distilleries? And so. That's a really good question. You know, we obviously we've done Westland and Catoctin Creek and, and we continue to bottle. We'll have more Catoctin Creek coming. We'll have more Westland coming. Uh, obviously, we've done Wild Turkey. Uh, what do we have there? Oh, and Balcones. Um, and we've worked with Whistle Pig. Now, granted, the Whistle Pig that we've done, that it wasn't their own liquid. I know. Look at you showing off fancy bottles. But I mean, the, the short answer to the question is there's not anybody in particular that we're looking at. But I wouldn't say the door is 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 closed yeah. to more. It's just that's it's not our focus for a few reasons. I wouldn't say there's nobody we're looking at. Okay. God damn it. So yes, there are people that we're looking at, but it's not currently a focus, right? I think going with Frederick's point here is that it maybe yeah. should be. There you go. There you go. I, I have to remember that. That I mean, even though he 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 led it with J and J, I have to understand that really it's just. Jay that wants to be answering the questions and not Jay, but Jay and not Jay and Jay, but Jay. Oh, yeah. um, Jay was invited here to answer questions. I mean, maybe he should do it. <laughs> maybe there's some other things Jay should be doing. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Who wasn't that asked the question about were we worried about this ruining our friendship? <laughs> <laughs> A very smart person. <laughs> what, what friendship? That's the part I want to get to the bottom of. <laughs> uh, oh, this, anyway. this, um, this is a good question and could potentially be a, a Segui. End of the company. <laughs> To the end of this relationship. <laughs> it could be a good segui, uh, or segue, as the kids say, into the next whiskey. How do you decide to, what goes into retail and what goes into being an exclusive? That used to be an easier question to answer. Yeah. Um, it, it used to be much easier to talk about the online as the special projects division, the spirit of collaboration. Or, lived over there and then retail was you know what could what could really stand by itself on a shelf and, and tell its own story which putting a glenbergie into retail doesn't fit that remit so the, the, and the other thing is you know we've, we've now got so many wonderful um retail partnerships now so, so many supporters in retail that they're asking how how do we get the good stuff? How do we get the fun stuff? How do we get the exciting stuff? You know, I mean, why is why is the fun, exciting stuff only going online? Which we never really thought of it that way. Um, mm -hmm. hey, what's tough is when retail says, "When are we getting the wild turkey?" And we have to say, "Yeah, that contract doesn't allow for that." But we, we're always asking about the contract. We always are. But um, but understand the contract doesn't allow for that. So mm. we are we are twenty twenty one looking at doing um, a cask pick program. We are looking at getting exclusives into the hands of distributors, into the hands of retailers, uh, and even into the hands of clubs. Yeah, we did our so we're about. I just poured my sample. So oh, okay. we, yeah, so, so, so get that on. Um, God. We I'm purchased. Like, slow down, Jason. Slow down, Jason. Hurry up, Jason. <laughs> hurry up, Jason. Okay. For, from here on out, Jason, hurry up. From here on out, hurry up. So a, I don't know, maybe two years ago-ish, 
we purchased a parcel of of casks from a, a Tennessee distillery, Tennessee bourbon. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give my Actually, daughter more screen time while I'm doing this, by the way. Um, yeah. Just right here. There you go. Yeah. So so we we purchased a parcel of Tennessee bourbon. And the reason why we purchased it is from for those that are familiar with Tennessee bourbon that has nothing to do with uh, Jack Daniels. Uh, there's another large distillery in that state that produces a very nutty style of bourbon. It's nutty meets a note that I love, uh, Flintstones multivitamins. Um, <laughs> but the reason that we selected these casks was they were very clearly not in the same flavor profile as what most people know about the these about this you know whiskey from this distillery so we put most of those casks into a bottling that we've called pappy nonsense you want to show people the the bottle of pappy nonsense yeah can i can i tell the viewers something a little bit naughty uh only if it takes less than 45 seconds all right yeah i'm being timed now let's see how this is well go, i'm pack. trying to get to my point and you're you're holding me up well, you you and points are often few and far between. Um, someone someone had asked the, the question earlier. You know what happens when we disagree on on selections? You know who wins, who doesn't. Oh shit! Uh, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm going to tell the veto story right now. Um, okay. What I what I am going to say, and, and this only happens from time to time, is I I bought this parcel. And you trusted yeah. me. You trusted my palate on that parcel. Implicitly. Implicitly, Implicitly okay. Jason. Thank you. Implicitly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And so so it happens. And sometimes you buy things. But for, to your point, an hour and 16 minutes ago, it never, it never goes into bottle without you and I tasting it. Uh, David Felder wants to know if it rhymes with pickle. And the answer is no, it rhymes with schmickle. So just want to put that out there. Um, and and Ben says a fickle pickle. Um, so so we've done with the final two casks that we had. Actually, we may have a third one. I think it's the final two. Anyway, with with some of the remaining Tennessee casks that we had, we put a twelve year old into ninety nine bottles, which is a shop in Connecticut. That was was that our first store exclusive? You always like these questions. I I don't know if it was a first store at closing. And you could argue in this country, you could say it was. Yeah, there you go. And then this is going to be the second JVS exclusive. As a reminder, JVS is our California distributor. And, oh. uh, and this, is, oh. this is great because people get to see the file that we have to send to <laughs> our printer. So they, you know, so they know where the cut lines are. So this is it. So it's a 14-year-old, uh, 57.2% natural cast strength. Great sipping whiskey with a wonderful, rich, fruity, spicy nose that leads into warm oatmeal with apples, cinnamon, chocolate on the palate before closing on vanilla and oak notes. Um, well, how do I stop this? There we go. So we're pouring that now, or we're, we're sipping that now. Yeah. Um, well, then the first thing I was doing was, was checking the oils in the glass. Like, even mm. just pouring the sample, I could see the oil collecting on the edge of the glass, which for you and I as texture guys, that's one of the first things we're looking at with any sample, is what does yeah. it look like in the glass and on the glass? And this is this is beautiful and unctuous. Let, let uh, me tell you how much... I love whiskey from this distillery, especially mm -hmm. single casks from this distillery. Four to five years ago, Barrel Bourbon um, sold a single cask from this distillery, an eight-year-old, into Gordon's Fine Wines up in Massachusetts. And every year I have my list of my top three whiskeys. Mm -hmm. And there hasn't ever been a time where bourbon 
made it onto that list. It was always a malt whiskey. And this whiskey, I think, was my whiskey of the year. Mm. And it, uh, if not the, if not the first one, number one, it was my second one. I ended up buying six bottles. I bought you some, Aaron Hirschdahl, who who may be on this, a guy in Canada. I bought some him, and when I flew up to Canada, I handed them off to him. And so, uh, uh, this distillery makes some fine, fine whiskey. When you selected this parcel. Yes. What was it about these whiskeys that turned you on? That's a that's a solid question. Um, God, gosh, I'm I'm going to be incredibly honest here. I'm so inspired by listening to Ollie Chilton. I just love the fact that Ollie tells it how it is. Mm. <laughs> you and I have a little thing. <laughs> Enter, you know, <laughs> insert own joke here. Um, we have we have a situation where we'll receive samples and we'll open the bottle the little sample bottle looks a little bit like this everybody's receiving them during the pandemic and we'll just t take a little unscrew and a little a little sniff out the bottle and a little sip right yep and and in doing that with each sample from this parcel i was already in it already had my attention yeah, just yeah. A, a little nose from a bottle and a little sip over the palate. I was already in, and so there I was. Um, to then follow up, get them into a glass, explore that further. I just thought clearly, as I as I already said with the glass, I thought the texture was exemplary. They were off to such a good start. I then not thought for the age on them, and, and like you rightly say, we've had them a couple of years. I think some of the parcel were 10, some were 11, and some were 12 uh, when, we, when we were selecting them. They held their age really well. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. concerns you always have with, with a bourbon and with you know a, a Kentucky climate or a Tennessee climate is that you're just going to get so much wood. And for me, yeah. wood was not to the fore on, on any of, of these samples. Um, True. Yeah. Right, and and the, I I just and I, I, you know me right when it comes to scotch I, I really like when the grain is present, and and I I do think barley is is a more interesting grain than corn is, but I thought right. these were interesting, and I thought the corn was present without being that overwhelming cloying sweetness buttery buttered popcorn kind of note. Um, yeah, you're you're smiling you know, at me, laughing at me. I'm smiling. I'm smiling because while I while I don't remember the specific ratios, I know that this distillery has a high malt content. Ah, there you go. There you go. Which which gives it that nuttiness. That's where the nuttiness is coming from. It's the malted barley, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's just so good. You could absolutely destroy a bottle of that over the course of an evening with a good friend or a couple of good friends maybe it's even with an enemy yeah. maybe even with an enemy not mm -hmm. a, yep, not then, an enema i know i know where you're going i know where you're taking that not with an enema with an enemy i was i wasn't gonna go there but i'm glad someone did um listen we we have about seven minutes left which really means we have about 37 minutes left given the way you're talking good. tonight you made, you made me worried there <laughs> um that's a very nice note from impact that's really touching it is a nice note i'm, I'm gonna uh should i put it up i'll put it up yeah that's lovely okay and agree. the reason i say it's lovely is because it's exactly how we feel about impacts so so to see it reflected yep. back is uh is yeah, really it's lovely good. it is really ah, nice thank you um so you that. and i cheers to that indeed you and i Especially the past four four ish years, maybe five ish years or so, uh, we have a knack for being able to to sell out whiskey pretty quickly, right? Um, and it's it's those it's those days we put a whiskey up for sale and it sells out immediately. We pinch ourselves. We say, "How on God's green earth is that even possible?" Um, all we could do is be thankful. And then as of late, 
is kind of unusual when we have whiskeys that stick around. And the next whiskey that we're going to pour is a whiskey that's been sticking around for a little while, but I understand fully why it's been sticking around for a little while. Um, and let me let me bring that up. I got a I got a big fire. Um, we are pouring our Altmore 30 year old. So this is a 30 year old from a first fill sherry butt, 465 bottles. So A, it's sticking around because it's a heck of a lot of bottles. And B, unfortunately, as much as as much as we trimmed our margins, as much as Impex worked with us to trim their margins, it wasn't enough to bring this Altmore, good Lord, oh, below a $300 mark. This is an expensive, expensive whiskey, but it is drop dead gorgeous. Look at the color on that one. Yeah. Yep. Very excited about that one. <sighs> yeah. What can you... What can you say about a 30-year-old Altmore that spent all 30 years in a first Phil Oloroso sherry butt? Well, here's, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the first. Okay, you go ahead, you go ahead, please. <laughs> you're, the, you're the guest, so. You're the there's guest, there's, you no, guys, there's no point me into introducing my answers uh, when I'm just introducing Joshua's answers. No, go on, go on. I, I love you with all my heart, you go on. Altmore is is a distillery that that's really near and dear to my heart, um, because while while Jason's passions lie in Isla whiskeys, and I do love my Isla whiskeys, I really prefer my my whiskeys to be more fruit driven than smoke driven, and if it's and, and fruity and smoky, yeah. And, 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 and very quickly, what's really interesting about you and I having a company together, an independent bottling business where we select everything together, is you are and always have been a huge Glenmorangie fan. And huge, huge. I would love it. I would name, and, and please, I, I don't mean this to be offensive. It's obviously top quality spirit. I wouldn't list Glenmorangie in my top 30 distilleries that I would ever reach for. It just doesn't tick any of my boxes and it clearly ticks yours yes yeah yeah it, it's i like fruit and glen morangy is is all about the fruit it's all the stone fruits it's all peaches and nectarines and sometimes delicate nuttiness and and so anyway altmore is within that sort of fruity style altmore bal blair glen morangy uh, Glen Glassa, right? Like all these more fruity spirits, um, which which really uh, get me so excited. And so when I saw this Altmore 30, I'm not used to older Altmores and, Sher Altmores and Sherry. And so I was very excited when I taste, I was nervous. And when I tasted it, I got excited because while there is a massive amount of Sherry in this, all of the fruit that I look for in Altmore was still present. It's still there. You got to dig past some sherry. And once you're maybe a couple of sips in, it be, it, it's more prevalent than it was. But I just love that we're still experiencing Altmore even after 30 years of first fill sherry. You know me. I'm just like you. I Older whiskeys, I don't want first fill. I want second fill. I want refill. I want fourth fill because I, <laughs> just a I, I bit. don't want maybe a little bit, just a hint, because I want to experience that distillery DNA. And when you're dealing with especially first fill sherry on a slightly more delicate, lighter fruit, Altmore, shit can happen, but shit didn't happen. Well, and, it's and, not and Altmore and sherry. And exactly, and that, that's where I was going to lead with in my answer is we, we talked to uh, Dr. Kirsty McCallum about this um, with Glenn Murray, and we talked to Stephanie McLeod at Bacardi about this. When you're looking at older whiskeys, you still need to, and, and this was them looking at it for the, the official bottlings, for their own distillery bottlings. The distillery character must come through 
after that aging, no matter how long that aging is. And the thing that we absolutely loved about this Altmore 30 is the spirit is still there. And I, I don't know how. I don't know how it survived 30 years in a first fill Oloroso sherry box. <laughs> but, it, but it has. Even the strength on it, 57.1% after 30 and years. I, th I think that's how it survived it. Because it, it's obvious they must have filled the casket a much higher ABV. Yeah. Yeah. And and so this the spirit just interacted differently with the sherry cast than it would if you were to fill it at 63.4 or 63.5. Um listen, we we're at an hour and 30 here, but we have some questions we have to get to. There's still plenty of people watching. So I, I just maybe we can add on another another 10 minutes or so. But Fernando um Castarena wanted to know uh hmm. no that's not the question that i was looking for oh really but he, yeah he's been asking some good questions well that's a yeah. good one to get to but he wants to know about uh club picks for single cast yeah. nation yeah 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 which um, it, the one that you yeah. put up i thought was was a, a relative of this one um yeah we are we're we're absolutely looking to to work with clubs uh and, and it's interesting. I, I like the fact that Fernando asked the follow up here. We haven't done collaborations with restaurants. We haven't done collaborations with bars. When COVID hit the hospitality industry in 2020, that's not a portion of our business that we lost. We've just been building our business in such a way that we've been hoping to add a cask pick program that would allow some exclusivity for distributors, for uh, retailers, and for clubs. And we've actually done club picks. We've we've been doing club picks for four years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've done rums for clubs. We've done Isla whiskeys for clubs. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're just putting a greater focus into it now. And so, Fernando, what yeah. I would say is drop us an email, info at singlecasknation.com. We've got a spreadsheet that we're building that will, in order, be people who have reached out about club picks, distributor picks, things like that. So please follow up with us over there. Um, but yeah, cl clubs are going to be a big part of this going forward. Um, but so will distributors and, and retailers. Yeah. Um, and then we have a, a nice comment here from... Uh, Oh, geez. Poor Mark Williams. He agrees with you about Glenn Morgie. Really <laughs> lovely to see Mark Williams, though. Right? He Connecticut guy. Remember, we, we were at his house in New Haven. He lives now in Kentucky, and he's working. Um, I think he's working with Castle and Key, if I remember correctly. Uh, but absolutely lovely guy who I, who I miss dearly um, here, in, here in Connecticut. Um, so Chris Wingate, another one from him. Oh, hold on, Jason. Can I, can, you hold that thought. Can I say one just very quick thing? Very quick thing. Very quick. Go ahead. Yeah, Brian, you do you. Brian, Brian Devorah, who's a wonderful, wonderful fellow and, and a huge yes, supporter and has, done, and has really helped us out in Arizona. I know in other places too, yeah. but really in Arizona. And we really appreciate that, Brian. He has something really interesting that just kind of skipped past a while ago. He said, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think your relationship benefits from both of you being vegetarian and i thought it was such an wow. interesting question because i think there's a certain ethos that is wrapped up in that that i think yeah. yes when you do share that with another human being i i think it does you know god what's the expression um grease the skids i, I think it does grease the skids, Brian, and um, yeah, yeah, and you know, and, and you know, obviously we've got we've got similar ideas on on how we raise our kids, and, and we talk about you know being dads uh, and how we're raising our kids, and and so yeah, I, I thought that was a real prescient point by Brian. So I, I didn't want I didn't want that to get lost because I know it skipped by a, a wee while ago. So sorry, Josh. I, I to you yeah. in your interviewing. I just want everybody to know the only reason you answered that question is so you could use the word prescient. Um, so uh, comment from <laughs> Chris Wingate here. Uh, sure, my glasses are falling down. <laughs> there, there you go. You're there you go. Um, 
Chris has been trying to find uh, a Scotch whiskey for his sister-in-law, who's a bourbon fan. It's been a challenge. Mm -hmm, I've come yeah. to the conclusion she doesn't like barley and heavy mm -hmm. sherry doesn't help. Mm -hmm. I agree with Jason Johnson. Yellen, barley's more interesting. Do you have any suggestions? And hold on, before you answer this, mm -hmm. Farina Ray's, I think in answer to Chris Wingate says, try grain whiskey. It's like bourbon without the new oak cask. Mm. Who said that? I, I think missed Farina the name. Was spot on. I was, I was busy reading Farina. Oh, fantastic. Farina. Farina Good to see Farina again. Yeah, 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 yeah. lovely. Yeah, we know Farina. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's spot on. I, I think that's really good. And, and actually, so, yeah. Go ahead. You, you, Jason, you're the guest. I can't, I can't, I can't just sit here and just say all the things that you won't say. I'll wait for you to say the things and then say the things you won't say. Go ahead. You do you. Five minutes, you're Jason. Go on. You're so good Go. at hosting your friend and business partner. This is, I feel so <laughs> welcome here. <laughs> um, Udi, Udi has been singing the praises of the Canvas 26 in the comments. There you go. And, and I think that's one. That's got a wonderful cotton candy quality to it that I think is the right kind of sweetness for somebody. <laughs> I just love the fact that anybody watching this is getting such a beautiful insight into how we record the podcast because you and I can see each other at all times during the recording and we both do the same thing to each other, which is 30 seconds into a, into. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh -huh. means stop at the next period because I'm about to jump in. Um, so yes, Canvas, please jump in Joshua Hatton. Well, I think your your note about the cotton candy is perfect because especially for people who enjoy weeded bourbons, there's this cotton candy note. Um, yeah, uh, oh, hold on. I'm about to finish the sentence. There's a cotton candy note that I think is a really good bridge from one spirit to the other. Jason, 100%, please. A hundred percent. And that was that came from Sweet Scott. That came from, from Christopher Hallstrom in Glasgow. And um, mm -hmm. he was the first person to talk about the cotton candy going on in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And hundred percent. It's such a good bridge, such a good bridge. The other thing that I would suggest to Chris for his wife is. Sister-in-law. This is. Who's Chris? What's that? Oh, oh, sister-in-law. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sister-in-law. Chris. I don't know. I said wife. Sister-in-law. Yeah. yeah. Sister wife. Um, is sister wife. Sister wife. <laughs> is. And and you know this is this is rule of thumb. It doesn't mean that it's always spot on, but if you can find grain whiskeys from in Invergordon or Cambus or Strathclyde or some of these from 1984 and before, the slightly more common practice was that they were using corn as the predominant grain. And then in 85, supposedly some of the distilleries switched from corn to wheat, but there was some back and forth, right? A grain distillery, you know, is a distillery in the end is a factory looking to make a spirit as, as cost effectively as possible. And uh, with grain distilleries more so uh, than, than, than malt distilleries, but at least 1984 and before, you'll find a predominance of corn being used as the driving grain. And so, Chris, if, if your sister-in-law is, is you know, loves bourbon, then find a grain. Cambus, Invergordon, Strathclyde, Caledonian, if you can find them. Um, 84 and before, typically you'll find corn, and it might be more upper alley. Yeah, it's funny that Pinchas mentions Port Dundas. I would not put Port Dundas in front of a bourbon lover. I think it's it's too diesely. It's too much engine oil. I love 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 Port Dundas. Um, I don't think it serves the same bridge uh, as some of those mm -hmm. others. Certainly, in Invergordon, so well known for v being vanilla ice cream. You know, if, if you've got yeah. somebody who loves corn forward bourbon, and you put something that's vanilla ice cream in front of them, I think you're going to do well. Doesn't hurt that we've got some Invergordon coming either. So we need to we need to pour our final and closing dram. Um, I know it's you so, have a closing so dram. This is so short. Like we've spent no time together, and this is so weird. I know. I know. 
I know. Um, I know what you have to pour. Yeah. No, that's not what you're pouring. I don't. Oh, yeah. What? I'll, I'll. Yeah. Am I doing it wrong? I don't have. You know, you're doing it right. I don't have the same bottle as you, so I'm going to pour I something. Think, I think else. people heard you say that. By the way, you said that out loud. You're doing it right. I'm going to. That's my new ringtone on my phone. Hold on. Oh, how do I do this? I'm going to show people the picture here. There it is. And so this is what Jason's pouring, the, the final. And this is, dare I say, Jason, yeah. your second favorite spirit behind Kilhoman. Is, Chig, yeah. am, I, am I correct in saying that? It, it is. I, I, I hate to show you this because I've cleared my camera angle so that you only see the best of my office. But over here, if I twist, please please ignore all the Impex bottles on the floor. Um, this this shelving unit over here will, right now it's in transition, but it will end up being floor to, to top of Le Chig. And so I actually, I, I have a small collection. Uh, I didn't take it out for air. Um, I have a small collection of independently bottled Le Chigs. And in that collection, I have zero OB uh, Le Chigs. And so I, I really like the single cask nature uh, of the chig. I like the cask strength nature of the chig. Um, oh, Joshua, what are you doing? No. Um, well, I'll tell you after. Go on. And for 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 a while, uh, the chig, the the OB, the official bottlings, had a, had a certain cat urine quality to them that I never like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, not a, it's not a room. Nobody would call this a room. Um, it, there was a certain cat urine quality to OB Le Chig that I didn't like, didn't find people who liked. But independently bottled Le Chig never had that quality, which was ever really peculiar. Um, and so I, I liked kind of just collecting. And obviously, you and I use this term, collecting drinking um buying mm -hmm. a lot of more than you can drink at any one time um yeah see my dad same genes you, you can't get away from it's in the dna um oh josh is in connecticut oh, yeah. uh, yes. oh, yeah. Failed us. Failed us i know in jonathan glass one good guy uh -huh. um, in connecticut. so yes. so yes. no no cat pissy um independently bottled the chigs there's such a nice sweetness to independently bottle the chig another note that i like in independently bottle the chig is um is that it'll, it'll have this kind of briny briny note that's almost yep. onion bagels running through it and as soon as i stick onions. my nose in it Right, if onions is another one. Uh, when I stick my nose in our uh, Le Chig 15, it's the sweetness that comes out first. It really leads with the sweetness. And then there's a little bit of the smoke around that. Smart question from Brian Devorit. What about Tobermory? Yeah, not 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 as exciting for me. Um, and you don't, you know, I don't tend to see as much independently bottled Tobermory. I'm also not looking for it. I am looking for independently bottled Le Chig. For me, it's the peated malt. And, and to remember, as much as it's an island, you're dealing with Highland peated malt uh, with them. And so it's not your medicinal, it's not your seaweedy, um, it's your, your heather. It's, there's the sweetness, the fragrance, the floral kind of quality to that. And so I love the mm -hmm. fact you can bring island distilling with Highland peat. Uh, and 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 more punch to it than Brookladdy who are doing the same thing on Isla uh, with yeah. their uh, mainland uh, peated malts. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there, for me, there's a there's a big difference between Tobermory and Lechig, even though yeah, same distillery, same stills, different barley. Because I don't have our own Lechig, which is a really funny phrase to come out of my mouth. Um, I do have this. This is from the 10th anniversary whiskey show bottling. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one that Ollie Chilton, who was not my last guest, but the one before that, uh, he's he's the gentleman in charge of selecting casks for single malts of Scotland. This is one of his picks. And the reason why I'm pouring this one, Jason, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I may have said this publicly before, may, maybe even in front of Ollie. I'm not. I'm not sure. But I think if there is if there is a single person within the industry who I think that shares a palette as similar to yours and mine, it's yeah. it's Ollie. There's there's no yeah. doubt oh, about right. it. He, you know, right? He he is he he's my sister wife. He's my sister wife. <laughs> Sister, work one. <laughs> um, let me see if there's one final question. Let me see. Uh, Graham Usher mentioned uh, the rest and be thankful, the Chig. Uh, I have that over on the shelf. I haven't opened that yet. Um, oh, Graham yeah. also went on to say, "What about an independently bottled Le Chig identified as Tobermory?" That was a, an internal uh, conversation between Joshua and I, where we wanted to be able to say, "Well, it was distilled at this distillery." but it's their heavily peated offering. And and since we did it that first time out, uh, we haven't done it since. So, but what we've done, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring this picture up here. Yeah. If people yeah, yeah. notice, this, this is one of the reasons why we switched to this new labeling system. If you look at that label, it says it's a Lechig, but it also says it was distilled at Tobermory Distillery. So this gave us an opportunity because you know, because Tobermory isn't the only distillery that might have. Uh, let me get rid of this window. Um, that might have a brand name that's outside of the distillery name, right? So it gave us the opportunity to highlight both things, if and when we, you know, if and when we we needed to, right? If we did a Brooklady, that was Port Charlotte, we would say Port Charlotte distilled at the Brooklady Distillery, which we actually did when we bottled our Port Charlotte. Um, <laughs> it was a great hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, right? A hypothetical factual. Imagine a world in which we do this thing that we did in the past. So Jason, Joshua. we are 16 minutes, we're 16 minutes over. This is the final in this series that I've loved so much. Being stuck in a COVID world has been, thank you, thank you very much, thank you, um, thank you. Living in COVID world has, well, to be honest, you, me, probably a lot of the people watching this has been easier than most people, right? There are some people who've had it very hard during COVID. So uh, big yeah. picture, all all beautiful in the world, big picture, however, uh, it's been tough, and the series has been a really good way to connect me with the people in the industry I love, and and the people outside of the industry who are such fans of whiskey and such fans of the industry, and are just in, invested as something that they they appreciate, right? And so with the the 2020 version of this ending, it hurts, uh, but it hurts less knowing that, that that you, my dear friend, my best friend, um, is my final guest. And and so I ask you, I haven't asked anyone this. I'm gonna ask you this. Oh boy. Um, do you have any closing words for people, right? What do we do on our podcast? We say, what are you looking forward to? What are you looking forward to in 2021 for Single Cast Nation? So oh what's gosh, the question? look at this. <laughs> oh my gosh, David! He, he's 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 a lovely, lovely guy. Yeah, what do you, David to say this? He he's, he offers this up voluntarily. Take <laughs> questions. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. What what are you looking forward to for whether it's for Single Cast Nation in 2021 or just the whiskey industry, whiskey world writ large? What what has you excited? I'm gonna gonna respond to two parts of that. Where <laughs> is that foreboding for the future? That 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 comes to us from Nacho, uh, with his NYPD detective mustache. So we'll we'll see what comes of that. Um, so so two twofold. Um, clearly, um, you know the the third word in our name is nation. Uh, and one of the things that we've talked about through this through this interview during this time together 
is community. And, and David uh, just mentioned it a moment ago there as well, where the, getting out and seeing people and dramming with people and talking about whiskeys, you know, from the very beginning, we've been whiskey geeks first and foremost. And, yeah. and, and we remain whiskey geeks while also becoming rum geeks and mezcal geeks and armagnac geeks and cognac geeks and so, on and so forth. And so getting to hang out with people again um, is, a, is, a, is a fervent hope that I have for 2021. And so that, that, that will be wonderful. The, the other thing that I'm really excited for in 2021 is the Cask Pick program. I'm really excited to see what we can do there and, and how we can answer those who want their own, um, they want their own SCN experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've, been, we've been living the online life that has been fantastic for us and, and living a, a wonderful retail life that has been fantastic for us. And now we're looking to specialize that a little bit uh, and to see what will show up in Connecticut what will show up in California, uh, what, what might show up in Texas or New York or New Jersey or, or what have you. That's really exciting to me. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to see where that goes. And I will also say this, because Ben Holman, uh, who, who may have tuned out a long time ago or, or, or fallen drunk under the nearest table, um, I will also say um, the, the new... Uh, the new launches that we have up our sleeves that will hopefully be 2021 launches uh, are Looking really that way. are really exciting. So, and, and here, my fingers. Yeah. Before, before we get out of here, you're you're clearly mm -hmm. an equal an equal partner in this business. What are you excited for looking into 2021? Um, there's a project. Jason, that you and I conceived of, <laughs> I think we conceived of it in, in maybe early 2018, maybe late 2017. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it was late 2017. Happening. It was late 2017. Late 2000. Yeah, there you go. Late 2017. That at this point in time, finally looks like it will be a thing in 2021 and in, in this it's got me so excited because it, it was such a smart idea and and i think it's evolved in in a way i'm upset that we weren't able to launch this new product line earlier in a way i'm happy because we were able to learn a bit and grow a bit and put things in place a bit more to, to make this more successful. So, so we'll see. My, my hope is that come Q1, we'll be able to at least start talking about it. But that's a hope and it's a wish. I don't know if it's a thing. And then, and then the other thing, um, I'm really hopeful with 2021 and the unfortunate thing of of the uk dropping out of the of the eu and then also combine that with a, a change in in um administration in, in government and administration here in the us that the the coupling of those two changes could could let us see the the 25 percent tariffs go away um it would be it would be, it'd be yeah, of course it's great for business as a whiskey drinker, man, did that hurt. Especially as a Scotch whiskey drinker, man, did that hurt. Um, so th those are the things I'm hopeful for. Those are the things I'm excited about. Um, oh, and got to do this one. Shout out to Jess, helping the nation grow globally. No doubt about it, right? That's, I mean, 2021 has us. We're looking at bringing on another person to handle many things, including this this private cask um, program that we're working on. But we've had Jess since September of 2019, 
and what a job she has been doing to grow our brand outside of the U.S. And so, and so that that's that's been exciting. So, Travis, thank you so much uh, for bringing that up. And we're going to end it on this. We're going to end it on Reginald Ritter. Um, thank you. That's all I can say is thank you. Oh, we've lost Jason. Oh, no. He's muted. He's a mutant. I've unmuted you. You've got to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Look at him being old. Look at him being old and not I knowing how to do this. There he is. My, my I don't know where the old thing is. <laughs> uh, so, Jason, uh, seeing as you've you've turned old in the in these past two minutes, I think this is a perfect place to to once again say thank you to you. Say thank you to to everyone who's watched today, and not just today. From the beginning of the series, I'm I'm seeing all of the familiar names. I'm seeing a lot of new names too, which is which is just absolutely lovely. And uh, and I'm going to miss this, but uh, this will return in some way, shape, or form in 2021. I it, I don't know when. It may be toward the end of 2021, but we're definitely going to bring the series back because it, it was good fun and successful. And there's no doubt about it. I've got questions and so do our viewers. So everybody, those of you that celebrate Hanukkah, enjoy the last couple of nights. Uh, if you celebrate Christmas, may Santa be very kind to you. Um, and Jason, thank you, brother. I love you. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>